I am Dooms Vince, and this is day 25 of Spawn Year. Despite the bizarre choice of Harry Houdini as Spawn's mentor in the mystical arts, the writing and plotting last issue weren't awful, and I had hopes that the resolution of the overlap and the experimentation of atomic powers effects on, quote, infernal matter might be going somewhere really interesting. All of that is wrapped up here in a two-issue arc, and everything that seems silly at first glance really is that silly or sillier by the end. This isn't the first time this series has resorted to plot points that make zero sense but are here anyway just because they're fun to draw, and it's taken to quite the extreme here. Houdini disguised Spawn as a chauffeur driving a Rolls Royce last issue, saying he needs to look inconspicuous. Surely, he must be joking. The first page of this issue is the Rolls Royce flying, Spawn driving it in that getup, which begs the question, does he somehow know how to steer a flying car or does it fly all by itself? And it has a personalized license plate in the front that says S. Cape. Oh, nice one, Houdini. Double entendre. Could be escape, or it could stand for spawn cape. I see what you did there. I love all these flaky pseudo explanations for magic, too. Last issue, Houdini sideswiped all considerations of logic by telling Spawn that the means aren't important, only the outcome because that doesn't sound disturbingly ominous if you read into it philosophically. But here, he does try to explain it with reason. You can't defy the laws of physics. Magic works with the natural world, not against it. So somehow you can time travel, conjure a car out of nowhere, give it a catchy license plate, make it invisible, and contain an atomic bomb all by working with the natural world. With last issue's explanation of the overlap, where all realities intersect and create a place where the impossible is possible, I suppose what he says is true. The natural order of things is making magic possible. But why not just say that, Houdini? Rather than cryptic riddles, why not just tell Spawn about the overlap? I hate it when these characters with all the answers to the universe refuse to put words together in a way that give more primitive but intelligent people at least the most basic understanding of a complex cosmic notion just to make themselves feel superior. So it turns out this lecture the head Soviet atomic scientist is giving, which Houdini insists on taking Spawn to, is actually a front to hold the city for ransom. The kid who likes to blow stuff up only coincidentally ran into Volokhov, the nuclear scientist, so he could fix the detonator for the atomic bomb, and so Spawn would have a punk to be intimidating to this story. At the end, he uses his newly understood abilities to scare the kid with an explosion that doesn't really blow anything up, and a threatening note signed, Spawn. I guess he's officially calling himself that now, and maybe slowly getting the word out that his alleys are SPAWN TERRITORY! This story is full of elements that never come together, like a bomb casing housing all the wrong ingredients needed to cause an explosion. The kid is unnecessary. The writers could just as easily have given Volokhov a detonator that already worked. And the most superfluous character here is Spawn himself. Houdini doesn't need him. Volokhov's bomb goes off because he can't stop it once he's primed it. That's part of the Overlap Demon's plan to use the bomb in their own experiment. And Houdini uses his power to transport and detonate it in the Overlap itself. Spawn does nothing. Houdini seemed to have some hidden agenda with regard to Spawn. Guess not. This whole story seems only to be here to further Spawn's understanding of his costume so he can do cool stuff with his powers without running the clock down. That's great, I mean, this book is in desperate need of plot and character progression, but the story itself isn't very interesting, and it doesn't need Spawn. I wonder if Houdini just picked Spawn because they both have cool capes. Volokhov is built into Al's backstory as a failed assassination. Oh yeah, that's great. Let's make our protagonist look even more incompetent by showing him screwing up at the only thing he's supposed to be good at. But that connection never amounts to anything but a lame attempt at making Spawn look relevant. This may be below the belt, but it almost feels like McFarland let Tom Orzakowski help plot this just because he's a letterer and editor. Like, he works with words for a living, right? Surely that means he gets narrative structure. I think we just have another couple of inexperienced writers here. Some inventive ideas, but 
entirely uncohesive by the end, so pretty par for the course for this book so far, with some excellent notable exceptions. I do like that Spawn is forced to protect Terry Fitzgerald. It's about time they crossed paths, even if Terry doesn't recognize Al yet. Spawn is embarrassingly reactionary in this scene. When Terry is attacked by goons snooping into this atomic bomb business, Spawn yells, That's my friend! Wow, what are you, five? Have you learned no self-control after you came right out and revealed yourself to Chapel? And then right after that, he has maybe the silliest line he's uttered in the series so far. That's Volokov in front of that building, or I'm not dead. That escape and Spawn acting all dark and intense and menacing the whole issue wearing that outfit, it's ridiculous, but I'm not going to say I wish I hadn't read it. Maybe the best way to approach the rest of Spawn year is by thinking about the whole series as a sitcom. Guns! Commies with guns! Really? Former hitman? Now guns make you angry? Cue laugh track. Signed, Captain Logan. 